I made a full stack AI app designed to help students streamline access to university information to improve a school's engagement. The goal of the app is to help save time while improving a university's retention through the use of a RAG-powered chatbot application, retrieving the latest and up-to-date information from official university sources. I launched this app about two weeks ago, and on our launch day, we got about 400 users, and in the past two weeks, we've gotten around 1,000 users using it, which I think is pretty cool. We have also 20 to 30 daily active users since I first launched this. And I got asked a lot of questions when I initially posted the app on my launch post. And in this video, I primarily wanted to give a technical overview into how the app works behind the scenes, as well as give some lessons to what I learned in the past couple months working on this app so that you can learn from them and you don't make the same mistakes as I do. And I think this app is a really good example of a way you can actually deploy an LLM into the backend of a web app, which can be used to help improve your community and give life to your AI models outside of the Jupyter Notebook. So when I first got the idea for the app around October of last year, I just made a simple mockup using HTML and basically vibe coded my way into this HTML page and it was pretty good. But now this is what the app looks like and you can see it um, has a major improvement. It has a responsive design, which allows us to create this, uh, allows us to store previous chats in our local storage, as well as have additional options to change the change the UI and give more customization here. But also allow us the responsive design allows us to make it work on or make it look good on mobile devices, so that we can open up the menu here and chat with it in the same way. And this responsive design was pretty important to us and was possible through the use of Next.js and Tailwind. Specifically, Tailwind has options for you to have different settings and scales for your different um, different React element tags when you are when you have the app scaled to different devices, whether it be desktop, tablet, or mobile. And it turned out to be important for us to have responsive design because two thirds of our users ended up just viewing it from their phones. So when I launched the app on Instagram and LinkedIn, most of them being on mobile, two thirds of them, the responsive design was pretty important. And nowadays, Tailwind and other CSS frameworks make it pretty easy and quick to be able to do responsive design. And how it works is you, through the front end, you send a question as a student asking something about the university, like give me a question about majors that would fit my interests, about the sports teams, or about registering for classes, things like that. And then it sends the question to our backend, which runs on a server in Python using Flask, and it queries using the GPT-40 mini AI model. And to make this model more accurate, what we did was we also included a RAG functionality. So RAG is Retrieval Augmented Generation. And what that means is that we have a pinecone, we have a database that's external to the server, which holds the latest university information. Things like official websites and policies that are all publicly available, uh, student organization websites, so you can have all the student organizations access and information, as well as different things like our course catalog, which has all of our courses and descriptions of the courses, which are all publicly available. We got that data through the use of a web scraper running continuously pretty much every day. Currently it's not running, but what it would do is every day, especially during registration period, it would run and scrape this information and convert it into vectors as it puts it into our Pinecone database. So that when I send a question to the front end, based on my question, it can convert my question into a vector and do a similarity search in our database to compare my question with the existing information so that it can answer the question more accurately and with the latest information. Because GPT-40 Mini, I'm pretty sure the latest training data it has was 2023 or 2024. So if a new policy comes out tomorrow, we would need our Pinecone application to be updated with that. So our web scraper would do that. And then our AI has access to ultimately the latest information. This is all running on an Azure app service container that's hosting it. And specifically it's running in Azure there and right now we have about four containers running, running, hosting the back end of our app, which acts as our REST API of sorts. 
And what we can do also as part of my plan, I can scale it up to 10 different containers if we have higher traffic. I don't think it ended up being that high, but it was just good to have that flex flexibility and functionality. What's also very convenient is for our backend server, GitHub has or provides GitHub actions for us to essentially deploy our app with a very efficient and seamless CI CD pipeline. Even if you use something like AWS and upload it to ECR, or I'm pretty sure Google Cloud has also the same kind of a thing. And how this part works is every time I make a change to the server backend, it takes our server and backend, puts it into a container, upload, creates an artifact out of that, and then uploads it to the Azure Container Registry. That's where you have the upload artifact for deployment. And then after our newest updates are deployed or they're uploaded, it then actually deploys them. So it, it creates our container and actually runs and hosts them on a server. We also wanted to compare how well Dragon GPT worked with ChatGPT and Google search, as well as just perplexity for fun. And we found that Dragon GPT had a higher BLEU score than Google search and ChatGPT, which mean all that means is that it's a lot easier to understand our Dragon GPT responses and they're generally more accurate. So this is our best version of an accuracy score. And when I posted it saying it had a 68% higher accuracy than ChatGPT, all it means is it has a 0 0.32 minus 0 0.19 over 0 0.19 gives you 68%, but it's actually a BLEU score. So anything above 30 is really good. You can read more about that on Google Cloud's, uh, Google Cloud's like documentation. Uh, speaking about the costs of the app, we used Azure App Service, which was the main costs of the app. I ended up going very a bit more expensive than I needed to, and I did the premium V3 plan, which costed about $50 a month if you include the other setup and virtual network that it needed because it's its own server that you can access. And we essentially deployed our own API with this, uh, with this server right here, so our, only our front end can access it. Uh, the good news, though, is GPT-40 Mini costed me about a dollar last month and last month it had the most traffic and previously in previous months it probably cost me a couple cents to run so the good news is ai is getting very cheap especially if you look at it per token on a per token basis and through a dollar i was able to get 2200 requests and about 54 5.4 million input tokens so just tokens if you think about each prompt as having like maybe 300 or 400 tokens can then extrapolate it to like probably hundreds of questions we're able to get asked. And also we have a Pinecone vector database which actually stores the data and that itself was free through the use of their starter account which was pretty neat. So we used the premium v3 plan which was $50 a month and I think it was a bit overkill than what I actually needed because uh, I'd never uploaded anything to the cloud before. I'd never worked with Azure or AWS before so it's like my first time doing it but I think we probably could have done something on basic and maybe done like the $12 a month or free version. Um, so that's like one thing I would have done differently before. Uh, that's like probably the first thing I would have done differently before is choose a cheaper cloud hosting plan to be able to get things up and running. I also probably would have launched the MVP, which was this ugly HTML page. I would have done it a lot sooner to get a lot more feedback. The UI, don't get me wrong, the UI of the app is really beautiful. I really like how it's done. One of my friends who worked with me on this app was a really good UI front end engineer. Uh, but I didn't have to wait like four or five months before I actually launched it or got user feedback from it. I kind of fell into the very classic engineer's trap of wanting to make something really good and perfect because really you want to make a good first impression on the internet. You don't want to be known for making bad apps, but the problem is the perfectionist in me led me to delaying the launch of the app, which is not a good thing. Generally, I probably, if I were to do this again, I would have launched this HTML page within the first week of coming up with the idea and then get more feedback, add more views, add more features and done a lot more continuous development with the app. And with that continuous development, I would have been able to essentially get more traction and more users. Because 20 to 30 daily active users is not bad, but I feel like I could have gotten a lot more had I launched it sooner and had I done a lot more iterative design. But ultimately, I learned a lot from this project and this full stack AI app. 
And again, I think this is a really cool use case for how you can use AI ML and put it into the real world to give a lot of impact to yourself, to your friends, and a community. Thanks for watching. And check out my YouTube channel also to watch, look at some of the other projects that I've worked on in the past. I think you'd really like them if you're interested in this kind of full stack AI app development space.